everyone. Um, Luben Pampulov, co-founder and partner of GSV. Very pleased to be hosting this panel with an um, amazing group of panelists today. Uh, it's called Media with capital E and D. Um, essentially how modern media is impacting and trans uh, transforming education as we know it. Uh, it's part of the global theme that uh, is going on throughout the day here in this room. Um, I'm, I'm joined by Tom Willerer, the Chief uh, Product Officer at Coursera, uh, Jamie Kassab, the Chief Education Evangelist at Google, Eric Harrell, the CEO at um, Kahoot, and Eduardo Mufares, the CEO at Somos Educação from Brazil. Um, media with a capital ED uh, is kind of a mega trend that we at GSV have identified, and we also say uh, basically how Hollywood meets Harvard. Um, this is a, a you know, trend that we expect over the next five to ten years will play a very significant role in education. Um, last year, end of last year, we did a survey on college freshmen in the U.S. and asked basically how they uh, learn outside of the classroom, um, what tools they use, what services, and it was very um, you know, confirmative of this trend. 90% of uh, students said they use some kind of uh, media platform like YouTube, like Khan Academy, like uh, Czech, Coursera, um, where they learn and uh, spend time outside of the classroom, which is very confirmatory to, to basically that trend. Um, so to start, maybe, uh, Jamie, I want to ask you. So you uh, were the one who launched Google Apps into schools, and um, right. I saw that ASU was the first university to adopt that. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the um, trends that you're seeing from that, some of the insights, some of the analytics that, uh, you, that you see today, uh, how Google Apps and YouTube is, is uh, used in schools? Yeah, so, so I think it, you know, what it comes down to is, I think 11 years ago when we launched Google Apps for education into the university space, and then like a year or two years later into K-12, we were having debates about whether we should be using technology in education, right? Like whether it was something that needed to happen. And I think the, the biggest trend is that now we're having conversations about how to use technology in education. And you know, where I think I get the most frustrated is that I want to move us quick, very quickly from, yes, we should be using technology in education, to bringing education to the next level with the technology that we have. Right? So in other words, you know, I totally get that innovation happens by first replacing a current system. So the tool, there's a tool that replaces a worksheet, right? a paper worksheet. So now you have an electronic worksheet. That's totally cool. But we can't stop there. It's about you know, looking at the best of what we know of what good learning looks like. Right? We have great research on what good learning looks like. And then asking ourselves, how do we use technology to bring education to the next level, not just replace the current system? So I think that's the trend. And it's cool, because now we're, starting to, we're having conversations about personalized learning. right? And, and that's great. Now, I want us to move to personal learning, right? where kids can actually drive their learning, where they can be involved in what they design. So I think that's the biggest trend for me, is moving technology from, yes, we should be using it, to now we're using it, to how can we use it to bring it to the next level. I think that's the biggest thing that I've seen. OK. Uh, Eduardo, so Brazil is one of the largest education markets in the world. What are some of the trends that you're seeing with your com company and just in general uh, in terms of how media is enter, you know, transforming education? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think uh, in Brazil, <clears throat> a, lot of the, a lot of the education enterprises came as well connected to media as it happened in other uh, developed economies. In the case of Somos, it was uh, owned by a media group called Abril. Mm -hmm. uh, which we ended up purchasing uh, less than three years ago. And uh, our understanding is that media has gone very far in Brazil in terms of how do you consume media, how you get access to different sorts of content. And in the case of education, I think we're, we're still lagging, and we're still lagging a lot. Uh, and is that because of... Um you know, internet connectivity, s smartphone adoption rates, or what no? That's that's not quite it because internet connectivity in Brazil is still below what it is in the U.S. But you know, it's in a it's in a growth stage. Uh, smartphone adoption at Pritfin probably is one of the highest in the world. Uh, internet usage uh, in terms of hours per user is the highest in the world. So that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I think 
at the end of the day, there is a lack of dialogue between the educational institutions and what uh, the end consumers actually want. And I think we're starting to be on understanding that we're in this transitional phase. Uh, I don't think that uh, the way that we provided content historically and, uh, and that we trained students is going to remain the same over time. And uh, our goal as a company is to really be connected to the outcomes, the learning outcomes of the students, which wasn't the case five years ago. So the way that we're preparing ourselves is how can we be a value-added partner to the student uh, uh, along, along the, its, uh, its student life? How can we be a value-added partner that, you know, at the end of the day, they're perceiving our, our enterprise and our activities as something that really adds value to them over time? So that's the ultimate goal of something that we're in the beginning of it, but, you know, as a as the largest K-12 company in Brazil, I think we have the obligation to lead that process. Yeah. And Tom, I think Brazil is one of the big markets also for, for Coursera. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific trends that you're seeing there and, and also in South America that are different than, than US or, or Europe? Um, you know, what we see globally is, a, is pretty high demand for skills that are gonna help someone be employable, uh, switch jobs, get out of a dead-end job. Um, get a first career, accelerate in their career. That's as true in Brazil and South America as it is the rest of the world. Um, what we see in particular is a lot of excitement for the types of courses that we're making available. I think in, in many of these markets where they've not had access to the type of content that's been locked behind the walls at Stanford or Yale, et cetera. Now, Right on cue. <laughs> this is the singing portion yeah, of yeah. our presentation. <laughs> Can we switch to samba, maybe? <laughs> We're gonna Hamilton this. <laughs> Attack needs. This is awesome, man. First power. <laughs> Have you ever been in, in a panel like this? Huh? This is a very diverse panel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're good. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I guess there's nothing in particular that's unique about what's going on in South America. I think it, it shows the same sort of hunger for the type of content that we're providing globally um, from great institutions. Okay, and one of the key metrics for media companies is engagement, mm -hmm. time spent, conversion rates, and so forth. Um, and then Coursera is obviously this type of company that you guys look at this a lot. You did some changes last year. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, Coursera started without a business model, essentially. We started everything with free, uh, which is amazing, um, but also not sustainable <laughs> from uh, uh, creating a, a business. And uh, I don't view education as something that the way to monetize it is through advertising. You know, it's not a consolidate all the eyeballs and then put advertising uh, out there to try to, you know, monetize that. So in our minds, we had to create some differentiation of what someone might pay for versus what's free. We started with a certificate, and in that certificate, it verifies that you actually did the work, and you can take that to an employer and hopefully get a promotion, get a job, et cetera. Um, where we've moved is kind of what you get in the university system, which is you can audit the courses where you can watch the lectures, uh, you can see all of the material, but if you want to get a grade, and if you want to get graded on an assignment, that's when you pay. So we've moved to that model. Um, that's very equivalent to what happens on campus. If you went to Stanford, you could sit through a lecture, but they're not going to grade your exam unless you actually are giving tuition dollars. Um, so there, there seems to be a mental model that's out there that I think makes sense. The next step there, which you know, sort of gets into media company territory, is we said, okay, a lot of our learners are taking sequences of courses on a given topic area. And instead of having them pay either in bulk or one off for each of those courses, why don't we have them subscribe? And they can pay you know, $49 a month and go as fast as they want through the content. Um, and we have over 2,000 courses that are available all the time, anywhere you want, on any device you want. Um, so now what a learner is able to do is say, OK, I now am in control of how quickly I want to move through this content. And I can cut costs and save money if I want to. And the amazing thing about this is, we rolled out a different payment model and we doubled the number of people that are completing those sequences. So it became a different psychology for people where they said, I'm in control and I want to move faster through this content. Yeah. 
And, and Eric, I mean, your company, Kahoot, is also is, is an app that basically lets users create quizzes and then uh, you know, use it in the classroom, in the workforce also. Uh, so it's a similar model. How do you uh, look at conversion rates and, and what kind of model you, you think would be best uh, for education? Okay, yeah, and, and I think one thing I'd just like to address also, because I think it's very interesting, this whole media, the impact of, of media. I mean, basically what we are is we're a content platform. Uh, so just as teachers are using YouTube um, in the classroom, you know, for education, uh, teachers are using our platform, which is basically a quiz platform to get engagement with, with kids. And I think that, um, and so for example, we have five million teachers who signed up for the platform, um, more than two million teachers alone. Um, have signed up for the platform in the U.S. Um, and we have about 45 million students monthly using, using the product. But most of that engagement is coming from teachers using the product in the classroom to get engagement in material, math, science, et cetera. So I think the, the interesting thing that we're seeing on the media side is, I mean, obviously children are getting a lot of, um, they're being influenced and the, the, these media companies um, are winning the hearts and minds of, of, of students. And that, that's not just Disney's and, uh, uh, but also NBA, NFL, these types of, of brands are, are having an impact um, and, uh, on these kids in terms of engagement. Um, and what we're seeing, interestingly enough, is, is most of our content today is, um, is, is teacher-generated, actually. Um, but what we're, all, what we're seeing and when we're talking to some of these media companies is incredible interest in, uh, in these companies. So like, we've won the hearts and minds outside the classroom. They have credibility with, with students. How can they have a play in the classroom? And so they're looking at Kahoot as actually a, a channel as a platform to actually you know, have a role um, in the classroom. And I think what's really fascinating from these discussions that we've been having um, with all these types of brands is that they're thinking about it in terms of um, uh, curriculum aligned content, but looking at creative ways to integrate their brands uh, into it. So for example, if you're a, a sports, um, uh, company, for example, or sports uh, association, you know, how can they integrate you know, sporting figures into, how can you teach physics uh, through football or basketball or, or things like that? So there's some, I think, some really interesting trends that we're seeing uh, from the media side in terms of trying to get into the classroom. When it comes to, um, when it comes to business models, um, I think that, uh, at least initially for us, uh, you mentioned corporate training. We're seeing um, a lot of interest in the corporate training market. So we have um, like the, our top 10 users of Kahoot are all household names, uh, pretty much. We have many Fortune 1000 companies that are, that are using, um, using Kahoot uh, for training. Uh, so, um, and it's a subscription model? Or? Well, I mean, right now, it'd be, right now today, I mean, we're, we're, a, I mean, we're pretty much a pre-revenue company. So we're kind of where uh, Coursera was at one time, which is we, we wanted to have an impact on education. We wanted to unlock the deepest potential of all learners. We wanted to engage kids through the you know, gamified learning, um, uh, but now, we're, now that we have, you know, I think, a very scaled user base, um, uh, we, have over, we have close to 30 million monthly actives in the United States, now we're focused on, on monetization and how we can commercialize the company. And I th the, the quickest path that we're seeing today is actually through the corporate training market. Um, there's a willingness to pay, um, there's some added features that we can offer corporates um, uh, that we think they're willing to pay. Uh, pay for, so I think that the initial monetization will be on the corporate training market. Um, but I think over time, um, you know, since we are a content platform, just like YouTube's a content platform, we're a content platform, we, we see um, interesting ways to, to, to monetize, um, more, more through subscription kind of models um, than anything else. Um, so that's kind of our, our, our thinking. Mm -hmm. Jamie, I mean, from, from Google's point of view, how do you look at engagement what are the key drivers for that? What what is uh, your opinion? yeah? So 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 a couple of things about that. One, you know, and going back to what you were talking about in terms of like preparing. You know, all of these conversations is about preparing kids, right? And so I spend a lot of time thinking about what are we preparing them for, right? And and what's interesting about that is if if you if you dive into this generation, like this next generation, generation Z. I don't know what we're going to call the next generation, but because we're out of letters. But Generation Z, uh, and I'm doing a I'm pitching a session. Uh, I'm doing a session tomorrow on this topic. Is they're they're an interesting group of kids that are coming through the system. Who are you know they're the first real true digital generation, right? We've called other generations that, but they're the cloud generation. Like they don't know that the world existed before Wi-Fi. Like they have no idea what that world looks like. 
Um, as a matter of fact, when you come sit on panels like this, most, most, of, most old people like me will say, I'm not tweeting, I'm just taking notes. A 17-year-old is like, duh, like what else would you do? Like, what, what do you take notes on, right? And so, you know, when we think about this generation and you start talking to them, what you realize is that they, you know, we're preparing kids for the jobs of the future, but what the hell are the jobs of the future, <laughs> right? And two, they don't want to work for you. They want to do their own thing, right? And like 70% of them want to work for themselves, want to do their thing, want to drive. So when we talk about preparing them for, for the future, it's not so much about giving them skills that they can be employable, but actually skills that they can solve the problems that they're interested in solving, right? And, and, and so for us, what we want to do is provide those tools at scale, whether you're in a classroom or whether you're not in a classroom, whether you are anywhere, right? If you think about one of the questions I get all the time is why is, you know, what's, what's Google doing in education? And we can get rid of the entire education team and we would still be involved in education because the minute you search for something, you're, you're curious, you're trying to create knowledge, and, right? and that's what it comes down to. And so we've been involved in education whether we like it or not. And so it's how do we provide tools for teachers and for students and for employers so that they can take advantage of the world's information at their fingertips so that it can be useful, right? You know, it goes back to our mission, uh, making information accessible and useful. It's pretty accessible. We just got to keep working on making it useful, right? And, and turning that usefulness into actual knowledge that they can use in solving the problems that they're interested in solving. Yeah, and, and I think that Google is the perfect example of a, a media company basically transforming education, you know, starting with YouTube right. and all the other things that you know, you're adding, that you've added over time and continuously adding. Right, what is some crazy number that is in my notes right now, but uh, 94, percent of Generation Z kids go to YouTube once a day, and 50% of them multiple times a day, right? Like, what are they, how can, we, how can we leverage that to drive learning, right? And not just watch, you know, Marley Sias videos. Not that there's anything wrong with Marley Sias videos, but like, you know, how can we drive learning through that kind of reputation or that, that they are already used to doing? Yeah. There is an interesting topic, if I may just comment, which is, uh, I think we're lacking talking about the social emotional skills that will drive you know, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs for this next cycle. And I think there is a lot of discussion being driven towards content and how content is being delivered. Everyone goes on YouTube, but you know, people are uh, not being able to socialize anymore. They're having, you know, and you know, the level of frustration that these individuals from Generation Z go through is enormous when they get into the problems of real life. So. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in our case in Brazil, this is, this is one area that we have been investing a lot of time in. How mm -hmm. are we going to not prepare for the jobs that don't exist? Because that's a very, that's a very tough question, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so everybody goes now to engineering. Mm -hmm. That's not going to solve it because right. there are other critical points that machines won't be able to solve over time that will need to be addressed. And I think in the, in the education context, there is a very few, very few moments that we're spending time discussing that. Mm -hmm. Right. Then how are you applying media to your schools in Brazil? Uh, because I'm, I'm not too familiar. Um, with so some we, of we operate a uh, proprietary network of 30 schools and we service over 3,000 schools. Uh, and uh, essentially our offering today is uh, very much still connected to paper. We're moving towards uh, digital, but essentially trying to build a connection between the classroom tools, uh, the off-classroom off tools, uh, teacher engagement as well, which is a critical point for us because uh, you know Brazil has had over the past uh, 30 years a complete lack of interest for people to be you know connected to a teaching career. So that's an issue. Teachers are very much that's not different from other parts of the world, but specifically in Brazil, there is a there is a big dilemma out there of you know how teachers will drive engagement and you know how students are feeling completely disconnected to the to the classroom activities. One area that we have been working on, which I think you know, has been helping us to, to improve engagement is working very much under projects, less in terms of digitalization, but you know, having a, a contextualized study helps, us, helps the student to understand why they are doing that. Uh, in addition to that, we have an intrinsic problem to Brazil, which is a high school that has 13 core subjects which are mandatory. So that's just alienating a large part of the students, which now we're undergoing 
a reform. So that's one part that we have been uh, addressing. And the other part is really focusing on the problem. So students have a national test that they need to take at high school, end of high school. So which are the offerings that we're, we're, we're providing to them that will help them to do well into that test. So it's a very pragmatic approach uh, to that extent. However, as we're going uh, on right now, there is a, some tectonic moves, including a common core that has been approved in Brazil uh, a month ago that will help to reshape the order of education now there. Okay. And Eric, do you use uh, Google's uh, education tools in some way? No. At Kahoot? No, no, we don't. But um, we, we, yeah, no, we don't, actually. Okay. But. And how about at Coursera? Uh, no. Oh. We use all the Google apps for well, our yeah, that's what I, yeah, yeah. We use yeah. the Google apps, of course, for productivity. Okay. But as a support. I yeah. go on YouTube sometimes as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think to we all to do watch that. Miley Cyrus videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, uh, so one of the things that uh, Generation Z Z is is obviously doing is going to be doing in education. I think is going to be augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, three weeks ago, Snapchat, Snap, uh, essentially added new filters that kind of uh, ens ensemble uh, augmented reality where you can you know, see at the reality and then add uh, these filters that are interactive. Facebook at the same day announced big plans to uh, push into that area in the future. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's not a science fiction movie anymore to, to, to see students in the next five years basically being all over the world and, and you know, putting their, their whatever device it is on, on, on their head and then being in a room somewhere together and you know, taking Coursera courses or, or whatever else. How do you see that entire trend, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, to transform education in the near, near future? Uh, I, can, I can start. start yeah. uh, so per, so if I feel like this is actually going to take a while um, because device penetration just is not there yet. Um, and the people that have the devices to be able to do this are, are uh, very particular uh, early adopters, and we need to see this become much more mainstream, which will happen probably over, over a 10, maybe even longer uh, period of time, 10 years period of time. Um, but if I, if I think, like, what are the interesting use cases for this, um, I think there's probably two. Like, where Facebook will go with this and, you know, maybe Netflix at some future time is, this is just a more engaging way to entertain people. Um, so you could imagine in education, this is a more engaging way to educate people, and they can interact with an environment. Um, that's one side. The side that I actually think is a little more interesting is, um, not that that's not interesting, um, is the other piece to this, I think, is human connection. You know, we love to be entertained and we love to connect with other people. And I think what this will do with uh, VR and AR is allow people to have those connections, and that's one of the things that you hear most about online education, which I think a lot of education is going to move towards, is that you don't have that human connection. So we have forums, and we have video chat, but you know, if you're able to actually put on some device, be in a room with an instructor, with your classmates, and have some human connection and interaction with them, I think that's like a real game changer for how <coughs> education is going to be delivered in mass uh, online in the future. You could imagine an MBA program where you're actually with your, your, your fellow students doing a project together. You could deliver that, quote, in person um, to an instructor and they could give feedback to that. And that's, that's a pretty interesting world that I think will be very useful, uh, especially to, to sort of uh, counter one of the main critiques of online education, which is that it's just impersonal and you don't get that connection. So I can add a couple of things to that. So, so number one is uh, I always like to start with this idea that this isn't a new innovation, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you walk around a place like this and you hear the word innovation a mm -hmm. hundred thousand times, and VR has been around for a hundred years, right? We've been trying VR for a long time. Um, I also think it's interesting. I also think it's interesting in the sense of not just education, but in terms of productivity, mm -hmm. in terms of professional development, right? So, you know, right now you're chasing little. Uh, uh, Pikachu's with your Pokemon Go, uh, but imagine a bus driver being able to have a pair of glasses on with getting real-time information and data about his bus, about things around him, right? Like, or you know, doing corporate training. If you're training a mechanic 
uh, to do X, right? And, and you know, all the information is right in his, in his, at his fingertips, right, in his glasses, if that's what it is, um, and, and what that looks like. So I think it has a huge impact in terms of having, you know, so think about information in general, right? So I think about my two-year-old daughter who's gonna laugh at us like, hi, you guys used to like have to have these devices and like use your thumbs to look for information, right? Where she's just gonna like, like she does it now. And she's like, okay, Google, play me the Spider-Man song, right? She does it today. And so like, so information is in the air to her. And then eventually information will be, you know, she'll be wearing it or wearing it on glasses. So information is just there. And so what we do with that information is critical. I also agree that I think empathy is a huge factor, right? Like you, you can see a picture of Syria, you can watch a video of Syria, but when you put on a pair of glasses and dive into Syria, that, that experience you get is real, right? And so I think that's a huge impact. But I also think that there are some societal things we need to think about, right? Like what's gonna happen in Vegas when we all can walk into a casino with contact lenses that have AR on it? Like what happens in that space? Like, you know, like think about that, right? And so, and so having that information, uh, VR is, is critical, AR blended it together, not just from education, but from a just-in-time information setting in the corporate world, in the, you know, the military's been using VR and AR for, for generations, right? Uh, if you think about a plane simulator, it's kind of a AR, VR kind of thing, right? It's a simulation that pilots have been using for 100, 100 years or 60 years. So, so I think that there's, it's getting to the next level. I also think that it's getting cheaper. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not an affluent thing in the sense that you do need a good phone, but you can buy a 10 cent Google Cardboard or make it yourself and have that experience. You can take a phone. So when I was in New Zealand a couple weeks ago, I took my, my phone and I stood in the middle and just did 360 video, right? Or, or sorry, 360 picture. So that when I come home, I can put it in the Google headset and my kid can experience standing in the same spot that I was standing in. So there's a lot of things that we can do uh, with VR and AR. So I'm excited about where, where this is going and, and not just in education, but also in what we do professionally. I can just add a perspective. Um, I guess it may be a sort of a complementary perspective or maybe a different perspective. But I mean, I think if you look at Kahoot, I mean, the whole magic behind Kahoot is actually the physical classroom where, where the teacher, I mean, the teacher plays a, a magical role. They're the quiz show host. You have the students as participants. And I think that, um, so I, I think we, we certainly believe in the kind of the physical, the physical world and the, the role of the teacher. The teacher has a very, very critical role in sort of um, influencing students um, and having an impact on students. And I think that human contact um, it's really important. I think one of the reasons that we've had such success um, as a company is the, and, and with this whole kind of gamification part, is uh, the game-based learning, what it does is it involves everyone. It's extremely inclusive. Because the challenge, I think, in a lot of schools today, in a lot of classes today, is a lot of the students are disengaged or in the back of the class. They're not raising their hand. They're afraid to raise their hand. They lack the confidence. And classroom airtime is being hogged by, by just a couple of people. And what, what Kahoot does is it engages every single kid in the classroom. The quiet kids, the, 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 the kids who are unconfident, it's all kids are, are included. So I think we, we, um, we continue to believe that the classroom is absolutely central to, to education and Kahoot has a role there. Now when it comes to augmented reality, um, one of the things that we will be doing, of course, is um, while the presence we have is really more in the physical classroom, although we do have a lot of engagement outside the classroom, and, uh, you know, students outside the classroom are using Kahoot to prepare for exams because we have all that content that's being created by teachers is also available uh, for students when they're preparing for math exams or si science exams. But what we're, what we're doing and what we're, si we're going to do over time is, is, um, is obviously extend the classroom from the physical classroom to the virtual classroom um, where, where kids can engage in Kahoot content outside the classroom and also engage with other students so what we see in terms of augmented reality is um, enabling students outside the classroom to engage with other students, students that they know, maybe students in their class, but also maybe anonymous uh, students. But I think the thing, the magic, what gets, has gotten Kahoot's the, the success is that social engagement, inclusivity, a little bit of competition, social, the fun, the noise, the sound of the, the Kahoot sound. We have this music, which is, uh, and, and so what we're going to be doing as we look in the future in terms of augmented reality is finding ways to recreate that kind of physical world experience that, uh, of what you see in the classroom. And so that's how we see augmented reality fitting into the equation. 
as we sort of take the company to the next level is finding ways to use augmented reality to recreate that social, emotional, engaging, inclusive uh, experience that we see in the classroom. But if you look at the presentation that Mark Zuckerberg did a couple yeah. of weeks ago, and basically showing how you know, we could be, you know, with our glasses, this could be quasi-reality, even though I am based in Bulgaria, you're in Norway, he's in Argentina, he's in San Francisco, you're in Brazil. Um, don't you think that this is something that could very soon be reality? And, and yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you can see how you could put your VR glasses on and, and, and recreate that classroom experience. I mean, I think the challenge, is, I think the part up here is just the, the cost. You know, I think the hardware cost is probably the, probably the biggest uh, gating item here, I think, in terms of driving, you know, VR maybe to the, to the next level. But I think certainly augmented reality is something that we can, we can certainly do. Uh, through through mobile devices, um, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I don't think it's one or the other, right? I think it's it's a combination. It's it's you can. Ha I, I I like that you're pro physical world. Um, the <laughs> so I, you know I, I I like the you know the, yeah I agree you know social engagement you know you know having that conflict that when you're in a room together is absolutely beneficial. But also, if I want to go visit a museum in Italy. And I can put on a pair of glasses and go visit that museum and look at a, a painting at brushstroke level. Yeah. That's huge, right? So it's not one or the other. It's a combination of utilizing both both techniques. Yeah, and I think just just to add. I mean, I think you can you can see how like you know Google Expedition can yeah. be very easily integrated with Kid Experience, sure. where kids right. could you know go into. I want to see what yeah, like, exactly. you just talked right, about. Exactly. Right, exactly. So it's something. It's some right. kind of historical lesson sure. or current events lesson on right. Syria, for example, and they yeah. can get kind of a feeling about Syria, but then there's a, a right. Kahoot or some kind of yeah. quiz or something that's associated with it. Or American like, history. Or like, American history or something like you that. Know, going to Gettysburg and just being able to look around and yeah. you know, things like that are interesting. Yeah. So, so as a school operator, have you considered adding a you know, couple of, the, like go back 20 years ago, at least when I was in you know, 25, 30 years ago, when I was in, high, in, in school, you know, we had like a few computers and you would go to a room and it was just the start of the internet and you know, one day per week we would go and like do, do stuff on the web. Now we're at this point where, you know, it's expensive to have so many devices, <clears throat> but you could have a few devices in the school where you know, students go and interact on a daily basis. I mean, is this something that you've considered, thought about? We, we thought about. Uh, I don't think the moment is right now, at least in the context of Brazil, where things uh, you know, tend to lag a little bit behind. But I think once it becomes available, it's a no-brainer for yeah. the ex school experience. You know, just for you to, for a student in a given class to, to be able to uh, you know, create a connection with something that would be in a page of a textbook is a completely different experience. And I think we, we can't neglect that. And uh, we need to allow that experience for the students. And uh, I think it's just going to wide, widen up a range of possibilities that today are limited to you know, a device or a piece of paper. So I'm, we're pretty much uh, enthusiastic about this. The, the matter today is that you know, cost is a major limitation. But over time, you know, that will go away. Right. Or yeah. remembering things. Right? Like I put a pair of Daydream. Uh, I like messing with my wife's 95-year-old grandfather. Um, and I put a pair, and he was a paratrooper in World War II, right? And so I put on a pair of daydream glasses on him and made him watch the, the jumping out of plane video, right? And, and he was like, oh my god, this is exactly what it was like, right? Like, he can't jump out of an airplane anymore, but, although I like him too. But anyway, so he, <laughs> he had that experience. He had that experience, and he could remember, he can recall, like, he could tell better stories about that experience because he experienced it again. Yeah. So, Things like that are very interesting to mm -hmm. figure out. You're not firing bullets at him at the same time. Yeah, no, you're not. And he's not going to crash or land in a tree or any other <laughs> things that happen when you jump out of an airplane. And so Google obviously made a big investment in Magic Leap. And uh, you know, there were some reports that later this year there's going to be something, uh, some announcements. I, mean, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but, but how do you see that playing into that entire, you know, into the augmented reality, virtual reality? Uh, space and, and yeah. education specifically, how right. is that going? I mean, so in education, Google Expeditions is, it, you know, the whole point of Google Expeditions is, you know, taking trips and going to places that you've never been before with some teacher content that they can use to drive a, a lesson, right? So that's really cool stuff. Teachers can create content. They can create the lesson plans. Lots of cool things in that space. And then obviously on the consumer side, 
with Daydream and other things. Like I went to, I spoke at CES this year, and I would say like 70% of the exhibits were like VR or AR kinds of exhibits, right? So, so I think we're just playing in that space like everyone else is in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Moving over to kind of corporate learning post-secondary, um, one theme that we have identified at GSV and we kind of focus on that is called knowledge as a service. Um, uh, sorry, knowledge as a currency. <laughs> uh, and it's essentially, um, you know, you've, we've shifted away from the old reality where you would get your degree, you would have your diploma, and you know, it's one of the good schools, and you'll get a job and so forth. Uh, in today's reality, you have a degree that not necessarily uh, helps you get the job you want. Uh, you then have all these different <clears throat> learning apps that uh, you can gain additional knowledge from. Uh, like a Coursera and like a Udacity and Linda and so forth. Um, and those are starting to be now um, acknowledged as, as basically additional credentials. Um, how do you, and Tom, you can start off, but uh, what are some of the trends that you're seeing and um, how is this changing reality in terms of uh, companies and hiring and so forth? Yeah, we agree. I mean, our, our view is lifelong learning is uh, imperative um, right now. So the idea that you went to a four-year uh, university and you just came out stamped and you're done learning for the rest of your life is just a notion of the distant, distant past. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. I'm sure a lot of us believe the same thing. That's, an animated, that's something that animates Coursera for sure. Um, and our approach to this is you know, we have 2,000 courses from over 150 of the best you know, institutions in the world. Now what we're trying to do is help learners navigate through that. So our version of personalization right now is really to help get people into the right fit, right courses for their goals. So they'll come in, we'll ask them questions. They're much, I came from Netflix, they're much more likely or much more willing to answer questions to us than they were to Netflix. Netflix is known for personalization. No one wanted to tell Netflix anything. They thought, you don't understand me, you, I don't, who cares? Just let me go find the content myself. Now, it was a big engine for Netflix, but that's how everyone felt. Education, very different. People say, wow, this is the path to me hopefully getting into a job that I really love. Um, there's much higher stakes here. They want to look at us like a career counselor, a guidance counselor. So what we're trying to do in the product is be able to automate that for people, give them a path, and then allow them to continue to learn. And I think, back to our earlier conversation, it's not just about the hard skills. So someone might come in and say, I want to learn front-end development. That's fantastic. We can lay out a path for them. But I think just as important, they're going to say, I also need to become a better public speaker. And we have a set of courses on public speaking where you actually record yourself on YouTube. And then your peers interact with that, watch it, and then give you feedback on this. And these are, you know, people aren't one-dimensional learners uh, and one-dimensional in any of these things. So the skills that you need to pick up to be successful in the modern economy, I think, are very broad, and they're not just the hard skills. And that's how we look at this. And we think getting people into the right fit of the courses that they need and then setting out that plan, whether it be the hard skills or the soft skills, is uh, increasingly important. What we want to be able to do and what we've done is we give people a certificate, and that certificate is verifying that they learn this thing. Um, we want to bring that down. So we, we have it on a course. Our courses are four weeks long. I think it's really interesting for us to go even more granular than that. So we can say, hey, we're verifying that you know this skill. Um, that can then be something that's on your profile in a more meaningful way than I think what happens on LinkedIn, where anyone just inputs any skill that they have I have friends that have a cat herder in there. You know, it's just like r random things uh, end up in there. It is a very <laughs> tough skill. Uh, uh, but I think for this, we'll be able to verify that and say, yes, you went through a University of Pennsylvania Wharton class. You picked up these skills. It was verified through assessments that had rigor behind them. And it's not just you validating what it is or your friends validating what it is. And I'm just curious, are you also hiring, uh, looking at, at this type of uh, credentials? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, the, the, the idea of learning is not necessarily the end itself. It's a means to the end. And many people have a goal that they, they want to do with learning. And I think that is to accelerate, advance their career, become an entrepreneur, get a job at Google, get a job at Facebook, et cetera. Um, and these are really important. So 
for, for what we want to do, we want to have the value proposition sort of transform at Coursera from, hey, this is the best place to learn to this is the best place to advance your career. That's going to mean us needing to connect the dots for people on how that learning applies to that job and helping employers understand how to find these non-traditional students and understand why they're actually great candidates for